Welcome, everybody. I am a Sue Ray, Professor of Physiology from Liverpool, and along with the terrific staff at FISSOC, we've put together what I think in... Yeah, I'm not going to be modest about it. I think it looks a really exciting, interesting programme. So the staff I want to thank right up front are Sarah Bundrook, uh, Christine Carr, and Nick Borostovi, and his team here in... Hodgkin Huxley House. So thank you for all that help. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today, as they say. So the purpose of this symposium is to celebrate the 100th year of women being admitted to the Physiological Society as members. Um, this is the final event in a series that the Society put on this year and um, one of the highlights was the book we produced and that book is the reason why some of you have the invites today because what we wanted to do was not just celebrate those who profess this that and the other but also of course the next generation of great female physiologists, which is why we paired a senior, if I'm allowed to use that word, with an early career researcher. So yes, it's a celebration. We'll be hearing the signs that they're doing, so that's looking to the future for sure. We're also celebrating because we're go we've got two fabulous lecturers who are going to sort of top and tail the event, um, and we're also doing something that I hope will help the early career researchers, which is along the lines of mentoring, a couple of inspirational talks. I think my two friends will forgive me for tagging that label to them. So that's Barbara Cassidy and Mariah Fitzgerald, um, because, you know, what a thing to have to live up to. Here I am, the inspirational lecturer. Yeah. <laughs> but they have a lot of good science and good sense that I'm sure they're very generously sharing with us. You've also, as I say, you've got mentoring and you've got networking events. However, yes, celebration, but yes, also, I think there is, if we reflect, still something of a job to be done for equality for women in science. And that's why I've also indulged myself and had the session on um, funding and gender, is there a problem? And we've got, again, I'm really, really grateful to the terrific team who've said yes to this. I'll introduce them fully later. But again, that's for your input. Again, especially the early career researchers, because this is your future and we want to hear your voices as well. We've heard that there are signaling problems at Farringdon, and one of our other speakers has also had a train cancelled. So that's maybe why we've got a few empty seats and there may be stragglers coming in. So we'll make them welcome, of course. So I think. On the dot, I will now turn over to uh, Professor Anne King to introduce a lecture to us. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anne King, Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Leeds, and it's my great honour and pleasure to introduce the patent lecture this morning, which is part of our event. Um, the patent um, lecture, prize lecture, it's an eponymous lecture named after Will Payton, um, who worked um, very much uh, to promote interest in the history of science and also the history of experimentation. So this prize really com commemorates um, his, his work in that area. It is an enormous pleasure for me to introduce um, the speaker today, Professor Tilly Tanzi, who's Professor of History of Modern Biomedicine at <coughs> QMUL. Tilly and I have known each other for more years than I am going to mention, so it is a wonderful um, thing for me to be able to present uh, Tilly or um, introduce Tilly this morning. 
We met each other many years ago as young postdocs. The first time we actually spent time together, any length of time together, was when we both found ourselves at the IUPS meeting in St. Petersburg way back in 1997 when we were young green postdocs and Bridget was also one of our partners partners in, in crime at that, at that meeting. We stayed on a boat, amazingly, a hotel boat. We had a wonderful time, but one of my abiding memories of Tilly was that while we went off to the meeting, Tilly would go off, she had a project in hand which involved, um, impressively, going to interview Pavlov's granddaughter. And when she came back, when we met up back in the evening, we spent the whole evening just finding out from Tilly everything that she had found out. And it really brought the science, the history of science, alive for us in a way which I think um, is, is rare in an individual for someone to be able to do that. And I think that has been the hallmark of Tilly's career. It's a huge passion for the history of science and the vast knowledge and so it's my great pleasure to introduce Tilly to you today and the title of Tilly's talk is Maud, Nettie, Gettle and George, the hidden women of the early physiological society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Anne. Um, I was very relieved for what you didn't say rather than what you <laughs> did say. Secrets are safe to me. Thank you, and uh, I'll buy you that drink afterwards. <laughs> um, several years ago, an Australian artist produced a book called The Great Housewives of Art. This is a pastiche of several famous artists, but as represented by their wives. So it had a hidden meaning to actually try to emphasize the roles and recognition that women needed. They were often hidden behind famous men. So, for example, we saw Mrs. Degas vacuuming, vacuuming, vacuuming the floor, Mrs. Van Gogh making the bed. <laughs> and my absolute favorite, which was Mrs. Chagall feeding the baby. <laughs> so they're amusing, but there is a serious <coughs> point behind these about hidden women. The women who are there in the background, busy working away, supporting men, and often not recognized. So it's absolutely wonderful that today, and in fact for most of the year, we have been celebrating the centenary of the election of women to the Physiological Society. And I think we should remember with pride those first six women who were elected in 1915. But by the time they were elected, 1915, the Physiological Society was nearly 40 years old. So where had women been for the previous 40 years? They didn't just spontaneously generate in 1915. There were a lot of women before then. And an analysis that I did of the early journal of physiology and the quarterly journal of, physio of experimental physiology, now experimental physiology, showed that there were over 50 individual women who contributed to the physiological society in the form of full papers, communications, or demonstrations to the society. Some of those women were extremely prolific. And here we have the top 11. And looking at some of those, you know, eight full papers in the Journal of Physiology, Mary Christine Tebb. Seven full papers, Marion Greenwood. They were both actually um, working in Cambridge in the, the laboratory of J.N. Langley. He was a founder member of the Physiological Society who was very encouraging of women, and he certainly had encouraged and allowed women to work in his labs. Both of these actually had uh, some support from college, uh, from Girton and from Newnham. But <coughs> neither of them, even though they pursued careers for as long as they could, neither of them became members of the Physiological Society, nor, as far as I can find out, of any other uh, scientific society. They don't get much of a mention in the official history of the first 50 years of the Physiological Society. This was written by Sir Edward Sharpie Schaefer. I will be referring to him later in this talk, 
and I will use the words Edward Schaefer. He added the word Sharpie to his name later. And of course, this is the first 50 years. Well, for the first 39, women were members, so they don't figure a great deal in this history. One of the things that Sharpie Schaefer does is he talks about the founders, the founder members of the society, and he lists 18 men who he considers to be founder members. These are the men who got together before the society was established to discuss creating a physiological society. These were the men who came to the very first meetings, who chaired the first meetings, and the men who started the journal and were the first editorial board of the journal. Somewhat modestly, Edward Schaefer does not include himself in the, this list, so I have added his fit picture here. For the ninth, so there are 19 men I consider as founder members of the Physiological Society. You will be relieved to know I'm not going through this and let name them all for you. But of course, these men weren't alone. They had wives, they had sisters, they had girlfriends. Later on, they had daughters. And as I've already said, some of them, like John Langley, supported women by allowing them space in his research lab. Of these 19, 17 were married. Two unmarried. Francis Bolfer, who is on the far right, actually died almost as soon as the Physiological Society was established. He died very young. So there were 17 of the founder members who were married, who had wives. How do we find them? How do we find out about them? Well, I went to two principal biographical sources. The Dictionary of National Biography, which is the dictionary of British uh, public life. And of this, this was founded in 1885 and is continuously updated and added to. It's going now, but it's now entirely electronic. And of those 17 founder members who were married, 15 have an entry in the Dictionary of National Biography. And 12 of those entries mention a wife by name. The Dictionary of Scientific Biography, this was started in 1978. This is an international dictionary of uh, famous scientists. And 10 of the founder members of the Physiological Society have an entry. Of those, five have a, a named wife in those, those entries. Strangely, another three entries refer to children, but there's no wife mentioned. So it might be easy to think, OK, well, we've got those 17 wives. We'll find out about all of them. I found that absolutely impossible, I'm afraid. It was difficult enough finding pictures of all the 17, oh, sorry, all the 19 men. But to find pictures of all the wives would take a lot of, lot of work going into lots of individual archives around the world to see if there are private pictures and albums. But I have been able to find pictures of some of the wives, and I've also found diaries, letters, and other references to wives in a number of different books about, usually about men. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of those interesting women. And by far away, the most glamorous was Hetty Carey Martin. She was married to Henry Newell Martin. And Henry Newell Martin was, again, he was a student of Cambridge, in, in Cambridge, of John Langley's. He was a founder member of the Physiological Society, <coughs> and shortly afterwards left, left England to go to America to join the new Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, where he established physiology and he also became a founder member of the American Physiological Society, the only person who is a founder member of both societies. Hetty Carey, who actually, she has her own Wikipedia page. She was a Confederate widow. Her first husband, John Pegram, was a Confederate Major General. And he, she was widowed after just three weeks of marriage. So she's very famous in Civil War history in America for her confederacy beliefs. After she was widowed, she retired back to Baltimore, taught, taught in school, and had a very quiet life until she met Henry Newell Martin. When she blossomed, came out of her semi-retirement and started promoting his career, and in particular, physiology at Johns Hopkins University. And she was regarded as the most um, able companion and promoter of physiology in America, 
And one of the obituaries of Henry Newell Martin says that he made, for a physiologist, a most fortunate marriage. Another uh, wife of a founder who achieved her pre prominence in her own career, in her own lifetime, was Ethel Romanes. Ethel was married to George Romanes, who was a zoologist and anatomist. And she was very popular in her lifetime as the writer of popular theological books. That seems a bit of an oxymoron to me, popular and theology, but she was very well known for her books, and she actually has her own entry in the Dictionary of National Biography. She is the only one of the wives to do, to do so. She spent a lot of her time um, after Romani's death in editing his, cons his letters for future publication. A, lot of a piece of work that was not appreciated by a later biographer of him, of John, of John, of George, John George Romani's, who realized that Ethel had been extremely selective and biased in her editing, and that much of her work was really irrelevant and, and could not be used. The same could not be said of another wife, Louisa Galton. She was married to Francis Galton, the geneticist, and she came from a very distinguished intellectual family. Her father was the Dean of Peterborough. He had been the headmaster of Harrow School, and all her four brothers <coughs> achieved positions of considerable prominence in their lifetimes. And it was through her family that Francis Galton really enjoyed a very rich intellectual life in London. When he died, Louisa also edited collections of his <coughs> letters and his records. And more importantly, she had kept her own diaries of his work and his, and his travels, which were a rich source for a future biographer. But Francis Galton is not particularly well known as a physiologist. He's better known as a geneticist. John Burden Sanderson, however, is extremely well known as a physiologist. And his career really could be seen as the, the pioneer physiological career or representative of a pioneer, a pioneer physiological career <coughs> in the late 19th century. He started off in the 1850s as a botanist, became a pathologist, medically qualified. Then, in the, from 1865 to the early 1870s, he was medical officer of health for Paddington, where he worked, on, amongst other things, on vaccination reports and outbreaks of disease. And his wife, Gettel, shown here shortly after their marriage, it's said that she, acquired, she actually um, acquired a, a, a mild case of smallpox because of infected material that John brought home from Paddington. <laughs> she worked very closely with him. He had to compile annual reports of all the public health measures in Paddington. Paddington was a very poor, run-down area. There were lots and lots of problems with sanitation, with sewerage, with poor housing, with infectious diseases. All of these data and statistics had to be compiled, and Gettel did a lot of that work. In fact, she is reported as always talking about our vaccination report, when it's actually, of course, John Burden Sanderson's vaccination report that was presented to the vestry. She is known to have done an awful lot for John Burden Sanderson, and indeed, this is the very first letter that was sent by John Bur signed by John Burden Sanderson to those 19 people, well, actually, he sent it to 25 people, inviting them to form, and you can see it, an association of physiologists, i.e. us, the Physiological Society. And he says, Sharpie, Huxley, Foster, Lewis, and others have, have actually said that they would be attending this first meeting. This is the first letter setting up the Physiological Society. It's reproduced in that history, of Sharpie Schaefer's history. But the letter, the bulk of the letter, was actually written by Gettle Burden Sanderson. She was acted as his, as his secretary, as his amanuensis, and the, the bulk of all the letters that have been found were written by Gettle Burden Sanderson. As time went on, and Burden Sanderson moved from UCL, where he trained, to become professor of physiology at Oxford, Gettle became very well known as really a hostess. She looked after numerous members of the society who visited Oxford for um, um, 
physiological sighting meetings. She would often have lady visitors to dinner, whilst the gentlemen, the physiological society members, would dine together. Lady Burden Sanderson, as she became, would have the women, the wives, to dine with her. She also organised garden parties, picnics, river trips, because the physiological society was and is a very sociable kind of organisation. And although I don't have any pictures of Lady S uh, Sanderson's din uh, garden parties, I do have other pictures of <coughs> physiological society garden <coughs> parties. And these are actually taken at um, William Bayliss's house. I don't know very much about the one in the lower right, but I do know something about the one on the left. This is either 1906 or 1912, and it shows here is William Bayliss, and here is Ernest Starling. And William Bayliss's wife, who was actually Ernest Starling's sister. And this, I know, is 1906 or 1912 because of this gentleman. And you've already heard his name because Anne mentioned him. That is Ivan Pavlov, the Russian physiologist, Nobel Prize winner, who visited London twice first time to give a, um, a lecture in honour of Thomas Henry Huxley, and the second time to receive an honorary degree from Cambridge. And on both occasions, the Physio Physiological Society met to honour him, both with a scientific meeting and with a social meeting, as you can see here. Now, somebody who is missing from that photograph, and I can identify <coughs> a lot of people in that, but somebody I can say quite clearly is not there, is Maud Schaefer and Edward Schaefer, who I've already mentioned as a the writer of the history of the Physiological Society, because Maud Schaefer died early in the 1890s. And she and her husband, Edward, were two of the younger members of that founding, founding family, as it were. Schaefer was only in his mid-twenties when he joined, the, when the, he was found a member of the Physiological Society. Now, there are over 100 letters between Maud and, Sh and Edward that survive in the Edward Sharpie Schaefer collection in the Wellcome Library. They wrote a lot whilst they were engaged, but when they were married, when they were apart, they also wrote daily to each other. And they were apart quite a lot because Edward Schaefer was away. He was at meetings of the Physiological Society, which in the early years was not very important what was really important for the advancement of physiology in the 1870s, 80s, and even into the 1890s was the British Association for the Advancement of Science and the British Medical Association. Those annual meetings attracted a lot of physiologists who identified themselves as physiologists, as a group of people separate from other practitioners at those meetings, and helped to reinforce their own identity. So there were a lot of letters between Maud and, and Edward, Edward often away at a meeting, writing back to Maud, telling her about the meetings. Now it's not the details of the science, it's the gossip. <coughs> uh, whose paper was boring, whose paper could nobody could understand, why? And there's a wonderful account, and I think it's a meeting in Manchester, maybe Birmingham, he just couldn't bear to go in. And he spent the day shopping. <laughs> it was just wonderful. And this is Edward Schaefer, Sir Edward Sharpie Schaefer. This letter gives you some example of the kind of information that was exchanged. This is a letter from March 1894. If I can just point out here, this is about um, Mrs. Oliver, who writes to tell them which train to catch to, to meet. This is extremely interesting. This is March 1894. Edward Schaefer and George Oliver were just on the verge of discovering something called adrenaline. It was almost the same week that they were working together in the labs at UCL and first discovered what the effective extract of suprarenal glands, which they called adrenaline. And here they are. <coughs> the families are actually socialising together. This is interesting. This is um, Give My Love to the Gotch family. Francis Gotch was then the Professor of Physiology in Liverpool, shortly to move to become the Professor of Physiology in Oxford. And the, the stern thing, and do remember to admire the baby. I mean, you, know, you can hear the wife there. The Gotchers have had a baby. Edward Schaefer might not remember. Remember to say the baby's a nice baby. And then this, 
Now, what this is about, um, some going to hear some passion music, and the burden side, the, the Schaefers are very close friends with the Sherringtons. Sir Charles Sherrington, later Nobel Prize winner. And here, uh, Maud is telling Edward that, yes, Dr. Sherrington is going to the passion music as well. Professor Cajal is still staying with him. Professor Cajal, Romani, Santiago Romani Cajal, man who you know, shared the Nobel Prize in 1904 for the structure of the nervous system. This is 1894. Sherrington has invited Cajal to London to give a lecture at the Royal Society. Cajal is a rather difficult guest. And you see, Mrs. Sherrington says that, um, uh, says, with evident he says, says with evident relief, he finally goes on Thursday or Friday. <laughs> Cajal really created quite a few problems because um, he didn't realise that people didn't strip their beds and hang their bedding out of the windows, which in Victorian London caused a bit of a scandal. <laughs> and also he locked his bedroom <coughs> because he was trying to develop some silver selections of brain. He turned his bedroom into a laboratory and he didn't want Mrs. Sherrington or Mrs. Sherrington's maid to go in and do any tidying. So I, I, I you can well understand why she he finally goes. Now, this is actually one of the really good letters between Maud and Edward. This is a more usual one. It was very common in 19th century to cross-write letters. So you can see this is the letter. So this is, you can see the, the horizontal lines. There are four pages of this. Then when you run, you run out of paper, turn it round, and then you're writing vertically across. And these are very, very difficult to read. This is a good one. <laughs> it really is, uh, because there are spaces here that help you get some words. You can start getting your eye in. There are even worse letters, not in this collection, where there is then a third level of diagonal writing <laughs> across the page. So these are very, very tricky. And some of these letters are four, eight, even 12 pages long, and with a lot of these pages cross-written. They really are quite difficult to, to read. I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, we historians <laughs> suffer as well. So. Now, as I've already mentioned, Maud died rather young, 1896. Her letters show that she was getting increasingly tired, but it does seem that she did die quite suddenly. She was only in her mid-40s. And Edward Sharpie Schaefer, or Edward Schaefer, as he still was then, remarried three years later. And quite interestingly, three of those 17 married founders all were uh, widowed in early or, or in early or late middle age and all remarried. And two, another two of those um, 17 married founders actually married young widows themselves, which actually says something about the morbidity and mortality at the end of the 19th century. In the final decades of the 19th, 19th century, the average age of death was 54. So it was a very, very different world. A rather older woman than uh, Maud Schaefer was Nettie, Henrietta Huxley. Henrietta Huxley was um, born in 1825, so her husband, Thomas Henry Huxley, was already in his 50s when the Physiological Society was established, and he was a man of, by that time, of some distinction. Henrietta, he'd met in Australia when he was a ship surgeon on HMS Rattlesnake, and they waited eight years before he had enough money to be able to send for her to come to London and get married. Thomas Henry Huxley was quite a pioneer and supporter of women's education. He taught <coughs> in the Kensington School, he taught in the Royal School of Mines, he established um, night school classes, all of which were open to women, and he was a very strong promoter of women. He, like Edward Schaefer, travelled a lot. He was actually on a lot of royal commissions. From 1883, he was president of the Royal Society, and it's reckoned that in one year he travelled over 4,000 miles just on the railway. In fact, his children just knew him as the lodger. He was there so rarely. Nettie Huxley is the only member, uh, the only wife of a founder who has her own biography. And her particular advantage, the particular skill she brought to the Huxley marriage, was that of networking. They had a very nice house in St John's Wood, 
And she, she didn't go in for dinner parties. What she went in for what was called tall teas, i.e. rather better than a high tea. This was a tall tea. And she, she wined and dined at the tall teas, a lot of the great and the good, and really supported Thomas Henry Huxley enormously in all the work that he did. Now, one of the most unusual members, of the founder members of the Physiological Society, was George Henry Lewis. He was the oldest member of the founders. He was 59 when the Physiological Society was established. He was not a physiologist. He was a, a writer, a journalist, a man of letters, but he was passionately interested in physiology. And if you remember that letter that set up the Physiological Society, Lewis was one of the names mentioned by John Burden Sanders Sanderson as being an influential catch for somebody to create a physiological society. He wrote a very influential book, The Physiology of Common Life. You see this here. And this was translated into numerous languages. One language it was translated into was Russian. It was extremely popular in Russian, in Russia. If you are familiar with Dostoevsky's brother Karamazov, there is mention, there is discussion in there of Lewis's physiology. And there was this book that was used by the, the intelligentsia, the burgeoning middle class of Russia, as part of their general education. And it was this diagram that was also very influential in a Russian translation. And this diagram comes from the physiology of common life. Because there was a young seminary student in a town near Moscow called Ryazan, and this seminary student, training to be a Russian Orthodox priest, picked up the Russian version of physiology of common life. He looked at this diagram, the digestive tract, and thought, that's really complicated. How on earth does that work? And he decided to abandon the seminary and go to medical school and become a doctor and then to do research. And his name was Ivan Pavlov. So Pavlov was actually training to be a, a Russian Orthodox priest until he came, came across a copy of George Henry Lewis's Physiology of Common Life. George Henry Lewis's uh, professional career was unorthodox. His private life was also unconventional because his partner was Marianne Evans, better known to all of us as George Eliot. When I say partner, they couldn't get married because George Henry Lewis's rather unconventional living relation arrangements meant that his wife had become pregnant by another man, and he, George Henry Lewis hadn't, made a, uh, hadn't divorced her. So when she became pregnant by the same man again, there was no way he could divorce her. He'd lost any grounds for divorce, so he was unable to marry Marianne Evans. And thinking back to those early pictures I showed you of Mrs. Van Gogh, Mrs. Chagall. The biography of George Henry Lewis is where he's actually called Mr. George Eliot. The, the, the irony would be better if he was called Mr. Marianne Evans, I'm sure, but he is known as the George who put the George in George Eliot almost. It's almost certain that she adopted his name for her pseudonym. When George Henry Lewis died in 1878, George Eliot, Marianne Evans, wanted to commemorate him. And she was in that social circle of the Huxleys, the Schaefers, the Burden Sandersons. So she turned to those people to ask for advice. And she decided to establish a studentship in physiology called the George Henry Lewis Studentship in Physiology. And she wrote to her trustees, and I've got a quote here, I have been determined in my choice of a studentship by the, by the idea of what would be a pro prolongation of his life, <coughs> that there should always be, in consequence of his having lived, be a young man working in the way he would have liked to have worked, is a memorial of him that comes closest to my feeling. And the conditions of the studentship were indeed quite specific. This was a studentship of physiology. This was a science she believed there was the least supported in Britain, was the most important science to promote, and she 
donated £5,000 worth of railway stock to, support, to create this studentship. This studentship has, over the years, supported some of the most eminent people one can imagine in physiology. I'm just going to look for the dates up until 1915, which is the date we're, we're celebrating. And if you look at those <coughs> names, there are some of the most distinguished physiologists in this country on that list. There are three Nobel Prize winners, Charles Sherrington, Henry Dale, A.V. Hill. In fact, there, should, there was, could have been a fourth because E.D. Adrian also won the George Henry Lewis studentship, but he didn't actually take it up. All of these young men, given support at the beginning of their career, when there was very little other way they could be supported. No medical research council, no welcome trust, no by fellowships. If it wasn't a college studentship or some other bit of money like the Drapers, the Drapers Company were very, very important in supporting physiology. How the only way that a young man could develop a career in physiology was like John Burden Sanderson, practice medicine, become a medical officer of health, for example. That was the only way, apart from a dedicated studentship such as this. Another 10, I'm sorry, not another 10, it includes, an, includes the Nobel Prize winners, 10 people on this list also became fellows of the Royal Society. Just a tremendous record of achievement from that endowment made by Marianne Evans, who is probably, of all the wives and girlfriends of the first founder members, had the most significant impact on physiology through the studentship. Now, sh I'm sure that many of you are not familiar with all of these names. But you can probably work out the one thing all these names have in common. <laughs> yes, yes, you've got it. They are all men. Uh, which seems a bit disappointing, doesn't it? Particularly as the trustee specifically says, persons of either sex shall be eligible for election to the studentship. Marianne Evans was really quite particular about this when they were drawing up the trust fund, but I can find no evidence that during that period a woman ever did apply for the studentship. The first woman who did apply was in 1918, and this was Winifred Parsons. She worked for, with J.N. Langley, some of whose name has come up quite often as a support of women, women in, uh, Department of Physio in the Physiological Laboratory <coughs> in Cambridge. She worked there for just one year and managed to produce one paper in the Journal of Physiology. The second student was three years later, second female student was, uh, sorry, four years later. And the third in the 1930s was actually Alison Dale, who was the daughter of Sir Henry Dale. And they actually became the first father and daughter um, partnership who'd ever won the George Henry Lewis studentship. So, by 1915, 1918, 1919, women have finally been recognised and they're going places. Winifred Cullis, one of those first members, first founder members of first women members of the Physiological Society, 1915. In 1919, she became a full professor at the Royal Free. In 1918, she had been elected onto the committee of the Physiological Society, the first woman on the co committee. In 1925, she was the first woman to host a meeting of the Physiological Society. Margaret Murray from Bedford College. Margaret Murray became the first woman on the editorial board of the Journal of Physiology in 1949. 70 years after the, after the journal was founded, finally they had a woman. <coughs> and two years after that, in 1951, Catherine Hebb became the first woman editor on quarterly journal, i.e. experimental physiology. They'd only waited 42 years before they had a woman. So although I, we are celebrating 100 years of membership, um, there always were quite a lot of delays in the society. And I think the rest of this symposium will not only, um, <coughs> will actually be thinking of going forward, because now the society has member women on every committee, chairs of committee, all the uh, editorial boards, by, I think, 5.30 this afternoon, all the prize lectures will have been given by women. And if you want to know more about the recent advances, do have a look at the book, because there's a lot of information in there.
and also a lot of inspiring stories of some young women and also ideas about how we might go forward, some of which are going to arise, I think, out of today's programme. But I would just like to say a couple of thank yous to two of my team who are here today. Caroline Overy, who is sitting at the back, who is an expert of reading that 19th century handwriting. <laughs> I'm very grateful for Caroline's eyes. And Adam Wilkinson, who is great whiz with PowerPoint, and of course to the Wellcome Trust. I'm currently um, funded to do nothing like this at all, work on 20th century, late 20th century biomedicine and 21st century biomedicine. I'm not funded to do history of 19th century physiology, but they have funded me for very many years, and I'm very grateful to the Wellcome Trust. And the reason the Wellcome Trust fund me is due to this man. This is Sir William Payton, of whom we've heard already, and who endowed this lectureship in his lifetime. He gave money to the Physiological Society, the British Pharmacological Society, and the Toxicology Society to promote the history of their particular subjects and disciplines. He was a very distinguished physiologist, pharmacologist. He was very um, supportive of young people. And he was very involved in animal experimentation, supporting animal experimentation. And this is one of his uh, latest, latest works, uh, just before he died, the second edition of Man and Mouse. And I want to make a personal comment about Bill Payton, because he was a friend of mine. And it's be entirely because of the Physiological Society, a conversation at a dinner of the committee between the then secretary, Tony Angel, and Bill Payton, who was on the committee, about why there, wasn't many, why there were many people working in the history of modern biomedicine. And Tony Angel said to Bill Payton, oh, there's this odd woman at St. Thomas's who works on demyelination but is interested in Russian history. And Bill Payton said, oh, yes, she, she, she's got a curious name, hasn't she? Um, I remember reading something she's written on Russian history. I didn't realize that was the same woman who does those the, the, the fish sock stuff. Tell her to get in touch with the Wellcome Trust. So rather hesitantly, I did. The Wellcome Trust funded some history of medicine. I didn't think a jobbing physiologist had any point in, there was any point in me applying to the Wellcome Trust. But they supported me, and they supported me to do another PhD in history, which has then led on to the career that Anne, very, uh, Anne mentioned. And I want to finish with a final slide, which is Henry, uh, Bill Bill Payton's own dedication to his own hidden woman, which was dedication to of Man and Mouse. Thank you very much. <laughs> and may I, may I just say one more thing? What you may have noticed is a lot of letters and photographs, historical evidence, which is the kind of material I work with. So I would just like to tell Anne and Bridget and others who were there. I have photographs of that, <laughs> that boat in St. Petersburg. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Tilly. Uh, my name is Richard Bourne Jones. I'm the current president of the Physiological Society. And it's my great pleasure to um, present the, the award for the Peyton Lecture to Tilly Tanzi and to thank Tilly for a, a wonderful lecture and a very appropriate um, introduction to today's meeting at Hodgkin Huxley House. <coughs> it's also appropriate that I am the person who's awarding um, Tilly with the Peyton Award because uh, for eight years when I was a postdoc, uh, Bill Peyton, who she's talked about, <coughs> my head of department, um, and I can confirm what, what T Tilly said, that he was an extremely gentle uh, and supportive individual. Uh, it's thanks to uh, Bill Payton uh, that um, my career in Oxford was facilitated as a postdoc. But I also need to say that in the Department <coughs> of Pharmacology, when I was <coughs> starting as a postdoc, I had two extremely important mentors in addition to Bill Payton, and they were women. Um, but I'm pleased to say that they were women, they're not the unsung women of science. These were two very influential women in science. One was Edith Bulbring, uh, 
Um, and the other was Edith Fulbring's protege, Alison Brading, for whom I first worked when I was in the pharmacology department in, uh, starting in 1974. Um, Edith Fulbring, of course, invented smooth muscle. I mean, she was the, the first person to make microelectrode recordings of electrical activity in smooth muscle. Alison Brading was her uh, postdoc um, who founded the science of radio tracer measurements and transport measurements in smooth muscle. And really it's thanks to those two mentors that I carried on in physiology um, and actually moved to physiology in 1983. It's also appropriate because I'm the joint director of what we call the Burden Sanderson Cardiac Science Center in Oxford. And of course the first um, female member, or at least the uh, alphabetically the first female member of the Physiological Society admitted in 1915 was Florence Buchanan who um, at John um, Burden Sanderson's request became moved to Oxford and became um, his research assistant uh, and actually quite by chance the two of them are, are buried separately in Wolvercote Cemetery, which is a small village on the outskirts of Oxford, just within the Ring Road. So there are very appropriate links with uh, today's lecture that we've heard from Tilly. And I'd like to thank you for really singing the praises of um, the unseen wives of the great and the good that was universally male uh, at that time. I think it's very appropriate that we've heard that, that um, the four uh, wives, Maud, Nettie, Gettle, and George, um, should uh, really gain some distinction for the support that they gave to the founding of the society and to the founding of physiology. But it also is appropriate, uh, again, to remember the six members in 1915, Florence, Winifred, Ruth, Sarah, Constance, and Enid. Uh, but when we add Maud, Nettie, Gettle, and George, we begin to realize that the army, that female army that supported uh, the great and the good that was male, uh, that female ar army is equally as important. So we thank you for this wonderful introduction today. So I have great pleasure in presenting you with this award. I might keep my fingerprints off it <laughs> because it shines nicely. So this is for you, Tilly, and thank, thank you, you very so much, much for your wonderful lecture. Thank you.